PhD candidate at North Carolina State University. And today, I have the pleasure of uh, presenting a new concept that I've been developing with Drs. Uh, Sunky Park and Hassan Jamil at NCSU and Dr. Daniel Sanchez at UC Berkeley. The concept is titled Enhanced Carbon Dioxide Removal from Coupled Direct Air Capture Bioenergy Systems. So most climate scientists agree that we need to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. Um, and there are various uh, scenarios that have been modeled in which uh, we achieve this. Uh, two scenarios are shown here, one in which we do not achieve it, which is the business as usual. And then the red scenario um, in which we do achieve the, uh, the target of 2C. And you can see starting next year in 2020, there's a rapid de decrease in net greenhouse gas emissions shown on the y-axis. Um, reaching net zero in around 2090. And um, most experts believe that the, uh, the, mo the, the majority of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions will come from conventional abatement technologies like nuclear, wind, and solar. But there will be some sectors of the economy that will be difficult to decarbonize. Um, things like heavy load transportation, including aircraft and shipping, and also parts of the industrial sector and parts of agriculture will be difficult to decarbonize and will likely continue emitting carbon, in which case we will need um, pretty intensive deployment of carbon removal technologies to actually uh, offset the uh, emissions from those other sectors, uh, sectors I just mentioned. So I believe that the United States is in a prime position to be a leader in carbon removal. And if we are to achieve that 2C target, as I showed in the previous slide, it's expected that the US will sequester one gigaton of CO2 in 2050 and upwards of three gigatons per year in 2100. Unfortunately, right now, um, the only moderately large scale operation for carbon removal uh, is at a bioethanol refinery in Illinois uh, at, to the tune of approximately one million tons of CO2 per year, which is only 0.1% of the 2050 target. So we have a lot of work to do. And therefore, there's a need for increased research development and demonstration of new CO2 removal technologies. So when it comes to the engineered uh, methods for carbon removal, there are really two leading approaches. One is bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, also known as BECS, and then direct air capture, which is also known as DAC. Um, BEX utilizes photosynthesis, so you have water, sunlight, and then air, particularly the carbon dioxide in air is used to synthesize carbohydrates in the form of biomass. So those carbohydrates contain a lot of energy, which can be liberated in the form of heat. That heat can be used to make electricity and sold to the grid, can be sold to the grid. And then you have this off-gas CO2, which can be captured and sequestered. Direct air capture is a very energy-intensive um, engineered process that actually requires a lot of heat and electrical power uh, as well as chemicals of some, for, some form to strip away the CO2 from the air. Um, but nonetheless, in some reactor or sophisticated refinery, you uh, achieve the same goal of pulling CO2 out of the air and um, sequestering it underground in a stable, permanent form, ideally. So interestingly, these two approaches have been developed rather independently up until now. There has not been a lot of research into the possible synergy between the two. Uh, so that's what my group and I set out to do. And the, the initial motive was looking at the energy output of the BEX systems and using them directly for DAC instead of selling the electricity to the grid because bio-based electricity is not that efficient, it's pretty expensive. So maybe really looking at the thermal energy, since these are very thermal energy intensive processes, um, if we do this, you could increase the net removal of CO2 per system and potentially improve the economics, which we also looked uh, into the economics uh, by combining the two systems. So uh, quickly just want to cover what DAC is. This is a relatively uh, new approach to carbon removal. There are two main technological approaches. There's the liquid solvent approach um, and then solid sorbent uh, technologies. And both of them more or less do the same thing. Uh, they take in air, they strip out the CO2, and both demand a lot of thermal energy. Um, liquid solvent demands a bit more than the solid sorbent. Um, liquid solvent technologies typically require very high temperature thermal energy above 500 C, and solid sorbent uh, lower energy or low temp lower temperature thermal energy. 
So the researchers and innovators in the direct air capture space have modeled a lot of different processes using various sources of thermal energy, including fossil carbon, uh, natural gas, and coal, for, for instance, which can provide high temperature and medium temperature thermal energy in the form of um, direct heating in a furnace and then indirect heating of water to make um, steam in a boiler. Obviously, the carbon emissions from this uh, approach would have to be sequestered along with the carbon emissions from the air in order to have a net reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. You can use carbon-free renewable electricity to power uh, an electric boiler to make medium temperature steam and then also a heat pump to make low temperature thermal energy. Nuclear energy can be used um, to make steam of varying temperatures, but usually it's in the range of 100 to 500 C. Waste heat from various sources can be utilized um, and recovered for low to medium temperature thermal energy. And then lastly, biomass can be used in a similar fashion as coal. Uh, biomass and coal are actually similar solid fuels. It's just that coal has more energy density, and that's because biomass contains a lot of oxygen. But interestingly, that means you get more CO2 per unit energy harnessed from biomass than coal, and that's sort of like an interesting wrinkle when it comes to carbon removal. So looking at all these different um, sources of energy for direct air capture, there's only one that actually could enhance and increase your net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, and that's using biomass. Um, so with that, we, we wanted to move forward with looking at coupled systems with BEX and DAC. So we set out to design a new system that's a standalone direct air capture system enhanced by bioenergy or enhanced by BEX. And then vice versa, we took a standalone BEX system and then incorporated DAC to see what that would do with the net removal of uh, CO2 as well as the economics. Um, and for each of these, we had standalone reference systems that we used for comparison. So the standalone reference DAC system that we looked at is actually identical to carbon engineering's system that's going to be um, built in the upcoming years in Texas. They just announced a few days ago that a 500,000 ton per year CO2 capture system using this exact technology will be constructed in Texas. They take natural gas as the energy source. They use it in two ways. One is in a turbine to provide electrical power for the process. That flue gas goes to a CO2 absorber, absorber sorry, where it reacts with potassium hydroxide. So this is the liquid solvent in this process. That makes potassium carbonate. That strips out the CO2 and the carbonate. Meanwhile, 6 million tons of air per day are passed through a contactor, uh, which reacts with more liquid solvent and makes more potassium carbonate. All that goes to a pellet reactor where it reacts with um, calcium hydroxide to form calcium carbonate pellets as well as regenerates the liquid solvent, potassium hydroxide. Those calcium carbonate pellets are then sent to a calciner where natural gas is reacted with pure oxygen for, in the form of combustion to make high temperature direct heating around 1,000 C. In doing this, the calcium carbonate pellets uh, liberate CO2, and you also generate CO2 from reacting uh, natural gas, which is basically methane, and pure oxygen, you get pure CO2. So a lot of CO2 comes out, the calcium oxide is regenerated in a slaker, and then the CO2 can be compressed and then sequestered. So this is carbon engineering's base case process right here. Um, and their, the capacity for their base case um, design is about 1.5 megatons per year. That's the total removal, but the net removal from the atmosphere is approximately one megaton because you can only count the CO2 from the air and the net removal. So now what we did is we took that same system and we incorporated biomass instead of natural gas. So we kept the same airflow rate of six million tons per day, and that uh, resulted in a demand for um, 2,300 dry tons of biomass per day, which was then gasified using a technology developed by NREL. That dirty syngas is cleaned up to give you two streams of syngas, and then since there's a water gas shift reactor in here, some CO2 is, is bled out. But anyways, these two streams of syngas directly replace the streams of natural gas in the previous system. Everything else is more or less the same, um, but then when you look at the capacity, the total capacity, which is also the net capacity in this scenario, is 2.15 megatons per year, which results in a 119% increase uh, compared with the standalone DAC. And the reason that 
the total capacity is equal to the net capacity is we're assuming the biogenic carbon emissions um, are indirectly um, carbon from the atmosphere. And we did some sensitivity analyses, which I don't have time to go into, where uh, a fraction of the biogenic carbon is assumed not to be indirectly from the air. But um, like I said, I don't really have time to go into that right now. So now we designed a standalone BEX system. So we kept the biomass flow rate the same, 2,300 tons per day, uh, into a boiler to make high temperature steam, which then went into a turbine um, to produce about 40 megawatts for the process, and then 70 megawatts exported to the grid, sold to the grid at varying costs. And the steam ultimately drives a solid sorbent amine adsorption desorption process that strips out the CO2 from the flue grass, from the boiler. Um, resulting in a, a, a net, a total net removal of 1.17 megaton CO2 per year. So then we took this system and incorporated DAC. And there's really just two things I want to point out here. One is all of the 70 megawatts that went to the grid in the system in the previous slide is now used to drive direct air capture. So approximately 10 million tons of air per day pass through this solid sorbent amine system to ultimately provide 2.46 megatons of uh, CO2 removal, um, 1.3 from the air and about 1.17 from biomass, giving a 109% increase relative to the standalone system. Okay, so at this point we understood that the capacity could be increased. Um, we wanted to do sort of a, a high level economic analysis, so we followed the same technique that was used in carbon engineering's technical economic analysis that was recently published in Joule. Um, we varied the capital recovery factor as well as the fuel purchasing price. And there's obviously a lot of other assumptions I don't have time to go into right now, but the capital recovery factor is pretty neat because it takes into account various financial parameters as well as the payback period, the project life. So a high CRF means a high cost, a high cost of acquiring capital and a long payback period. Um, I'm sorry, a short, a short payback period. And then a low CRF means a very cheap capital and a long payback period. So a low CRF, like 2.5%, would really only be possible with very strong government support. Um, more realistically, in the near term, investment would come in the form of 125 to 17.5%. So nonetheless, uh, we looked at the standalone reference system and the uh, solvent DAC system enhanced by biomass and looked at the levelized costs of CO2 removal, so dollars per ton CO2. And across all analyzed parameters for this particular scenario, the biomass enhanced system was more cost effective. That's assuming all of the biogenic emissions can be included in the economic calculations. If you assume none of the biogenic CO2 can be taken into account when you're analyzing the economics, the costs dramatically increase. So the range goes from 54 to uh, 268 up to 118 to 409, uh, so much more expensive. So now we did the same thing with the standalone BEX system, and then the BEX system enhanced by DAC, and we were able to show that um, approximately half of the analyzed parameters were more cost effective once DAC was incorporated into the BEX system. And then when you assume that none of the biogenic emissions can be counted in the economics, the price goes up substantially. All right? And so this is, this is similar to how most carbon removal systems, at least direct air capture systems, are modeled today. Uh, since they use fossil fuels, you can't use the CO2 emitted from the fossil fuel in the economic equation. But when you use biomass, you can. So the costs drop. The denominator gets bigger, and the costs drop. OK, so we showed that the carbon removal capacity could be increased. We showed, from a, a high-level perspective, the economics appear to be favorable when you inc incorporate biomass to DAC or DAC to biomass. So the last thing we did was a geospatial analysis looking at the biomass availability in all counties in the uh, contiguous United States uh, using the Department of Energy's billion ton study for the year 2030. And we were able to show that if you take the BEX system that's enhanced with DAC and implement that across the country, you could sequester 2.3 gigatons of CO2 per year using sustainable non-food sources of biomass. And then, more importantly, when looking at the land area that overlays suitable geology for long-term CO2 storage, uh, 
the capacity is increased to 1.2 gigatons of CO2 per year. So uh, suffice to say, it seems possible to reach gigaton scale carbon removal by coupling um, bioenergy with carbon capture and direct air capture using um, uh, land that overlays geology suitable for long-term uh, long storage. So to conclude, uh, biomass provides high, medium, and po even potentially low temperature thermal energy at relatively low cost for DAC. Um, it's possible that bioenergy dedicated to DAC may be more effective than its uh, dedication for grid power, which is what most of the BEX technologies being developed today assume um, that they will be making electricity for the grid, but maybe it's better to use just the, the heat, the bio heat for direct air capture. DAC imparts advantages to bioenergy systems, which rely on geographically dispersed low energy density biomass resources. Uh, the BEX stack coupled systems increase net removal of CO2 by 109 to 119%. Uh, compared to the standalone systems. And then finally, the coupled systems enable cost-effective removal of CO2 potentially on a gigaton scale. So with that, I want to thank you for your time, and I'll take questions if there's any time. Let me start by asking a question. Sure. Um, if you take out CO2, it doesn't matter where you do it on the planet Earth. That's right. It strikes me that the best place to put this is in Siberia. Yeah. Because there's no competing use of biomass in large chunks of Siberia. Sure. Then have you done anything, you know, it's just like the gas version, the best place is West Texas. Right, there's lots of gas. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah. cheap gas. Have you done any thinking about, if you were thinking globally, where you would deploy this kind of system outside of obviously Siberia and, and the middle of Canada, which are sort of inaccessible for any other use of the biomass in those right. locations? No, that's a great question. Um, not yet, but... You're, you're right on that it's best to find large land areas with low populations that are suitable for biomass growth uh, that can be sustainably harvested year after year. Um, that would make a lot of sense. So it's a good point. And you know, implementing BEX there, you'd be producing a lot of electricity, which is great, but if there's no one to consume it, I mean, you could make fuels out of it, for instance, but um, according to the UN and the IPCC, carbon removals, a serious thing now and something that's being included in all of the forecasts. So, um, you know, we got to find ways to suck out a lot of CO2 quickly. So. It strikes me. Want to pick the place that's. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Any other questions? Did I understand correctly uh, there, there are emissions from the biomass combustion in, in the process? Upstream? Or uh, no, just from. In, in your process of carbon capture. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's there, a, you're, all the biomass is being combusted in some form. And some of that is released to the atmosphere? That's a good question. In the numbers I presented here, no. Uh, well, 90% of the CO2 is captured. From the combustion? Yeah, 90%. Okay. But then we do sensitivity analyses uh, taking into account upstream emissions, which increase costs, because then you can't account for all the CO2 that's captured as net removal. Okay. Um, so yeah, Great. sorry guys. Thank you very much. Yep. Is one of you Vita, per chance? No, we were missing a previous speaker. Okay, so we'll move on. Our next speaker, I think, is Alberto.